Take it away, Jennifer. Great. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. It's great to have a lot of repeat customers and some new faces as well. I am Jennifer Kaiser Nelson with Vallejo Flood and Wastewater District and here representing the Solano Stormwater Alliance. And the public agencies that participate in the Alliance are really uh, dedicated to preserving, protecting water quality. And so this kind of program like Our Water, Our World, what you're in today, uh, is a big priority for us to make sure people are getting access to the information they need to make good decisions about uh, purchasing uh, products that are healthy for themselves and their families and their pets and the soil and the water as well. So thanks everybody. And uh, we're here with Andrea Solis, uh, an outreach intern at Fairfield Sassoon Sewer District, which is also part of the Stormwater Alliance. And we both, Andrea and I are super happy to have Suzanne here, who's gonna teach us all about effective weed management. And, and what's nice about the little bit of rain we got today is it makes it easier to pull. So there you go. All right, take it away, Suzanne. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I'm so happy to be here. And yeah, timely. We are gonna talk about how to manage our weeds safely and effectively. So uh, I am going to, I'm packing in the program, you know, got a lot of information as usual. So I'm going to pack it in. What we're going to talk about today is uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Our Water, Our World program and introduction, and then just a review of uh, integrated pest management. And then we're going to talk about what weeds are, identif identification tips, prevention strategies, uh, effective weed management, and then when we're using herbicides, um, you know, those weed killers, because all of us are very curious about them. I'm gonna review uh, some tips about the herbicides, mm -hmm. and then I'm gonna provide some additional resources. So Our Water, Our World is a national award-winning clean water program. Uh, Our Water, Our World's goal is to bring awareness between pesticides and water quality by explaining how products that we use around our home and garden can end up polluting our local waterways. We partner with water pollution prevention agencies and retailers that sell pesticides, and we provide integrated pest management education to both the retail associates and to the public around less toxic pest management. You can learn more about the OWOW program at ourwaterourworld.org. And I like to always start off with our, our you know, watersheds, our gardens and water quality, how are they related? Remembering that a watershed it is an area of land that drains or sheds that water to a single body of water. So watersheds drain any rainwater or snow melt that isn't absorbed into the ground, into a stream, a creek, river, uh, that can flow to a lake, a bay, a reservoir, a stormwater basin, or the ocean. So around our properties and our streets and parking lots, all of that water that isn't absorbed into the ground can run off into a storm drain and goes untreated to the nearest waterway, taking with it chemicals, pet waste, motor oil, debris, fertilizers, residuals from pesticides, and whatever is out, out whatever else is out there in the environment. So the OWL, Our Water Our World, is uh, this program is designed to draw that connection between pollutants and water quality. And so we just like to remind folks that all the things that we do around our yards or neighborhoods or anywhere out there in the world, um, like spraying pesticides, washing our cars, walking our dogs, we are potentially creating pollutants. So we always like to provide that education and awareness on what are the alternative products that are available that will not uh, pollute our waterways. So integrated pest management is what we teach. It's a decision-making process based on science-based strategies. Uh, we look at the system as a whole, be it the garden, inside the house, and we start to first, um, we have to identify what the problem is. And then we start to ask ourselves a number of questions like, can we live with it? What's the threshold of tolerance for us? Because oftentimes it's different than what the garden can handle. The garden or the plants threshold is usually a lot higher than ours. And then from there, if we need to uh, take some action, 
uh, the action steps in IPM are called controls. There's cultural controls, increasing the health of the environment, uh, such as the garden, mechanical controls or physical controls. We, these are the tools we use to manage the pest problem. Biological controls are working with living organisms to manage that pest problem. And then chemical controls, which we always wanna use as a last resort, are the pesticides. And we're always gonna choose eco-friendly. And we're only using them after we've exhausted all of the other uh, actions. So just like to uh, review IPM for managing weeds. We are going to identify them. We're going to look at how to prevent them. And then we're going to uh, focus on early detection and, rem and removal. So a weed is a plant that has mastered every survival skill except for learning how to grow in rows. I just love this quote. So I thought I'd start off with that. And as I shared with some of you prior, all of the, uh, or the majority of all the photos are weeds from my garden. So you can see what I am faced with uh, on a regular seasonal basis. <laughs> I am right there with you with weeding or managing weeds. So but what is a weed? A weed is a plant growing in an undesirable place. So it's up to us to determine if it's something that's desirable or not. So you're going to see some references to plants that are actually, some of us would be really surprised that it's considered a weed. Or in my case, I have chard and kale, which are food crops that reseed easily throughout my garden. So in some cases, I do have to pull them, which is a little unusual. I will eat them, but I also have to weed them out of some areas. And then, um, so that might be something you're faced with. Something that's really helpful in regards to pest management or weed, specifically weed management, is the University of California has this amazing uh, gallery that helps us identify the weeds. And that's going to really be uh, extremely important as we move through the program, you'll learn why. But how we manage weeds will determine, um, will really be determined on the type of weed that it is. So let's talk about how we can get to know our weeds a little better. So annual weeds are those that will sprout only from the seed and they typically just have a one year or they only have a one year life cycle. So though uh, seed, seed will germinate, plant will grow, it'll go to flower, more seeds will then drop and it'll grow next year. Biannual weeds uh, also sprout from seeds, but they live two years. So the first year they grow, the second year they will go to flower, they will um, drop their seeds. Um, sometimes they'll go through the cycle twice, but they only have a two-year life, uh, lifespan. And then perennial weeds will uh, grow longer than two years. They actually are going to grow from seed or and or from the roots. The roots could be tubers, corms, bulbs, stems, and roots uh, that live longer than the two years. And the examples would be Bermuda and Drangia. And that would be um, plants like the Bermuda grass, the oxalis, the yellow nut sedge. And when do we see weeds? Well, I think we're seeing a lot of them right now since we've had so many rains, but there's the cool rainy season weeds that are very common, such as the oxalis, the chickweed, and many of the grasses like the uh, annual bluegrass, the poa annua. And then warm season weeds are going to be those that we see during the drier summer months, such as the annual purslane, mallow, crabgrass, and the perennial bindweed, just to mention a few. There are so many more that are problematic. And then, um, so now what we're gonna do is look at the cultural controls for these types of weeds, okay? So we're, cultural controls, we can think about adjusting the environment to make the weeds less desirable. So that's the idea is we want to make it less desirable for the plants we don't want and more desirable for the plants that we do want. So we're gonna look at the soil, acidic soil, um, there are several types of weeds that thrive in acidic so soil, such as the sorrel, the dandelions, plantain, stinging nettle. Uh, alkaline soils, we're going to see chicory, queen anne's lace, salad, burnet. These are common weeds that thrive in alkaline soil conditions. Uh, nutrient poor soils, we're going to see mugwort, thistles, vetch, sheep sorrel, yarrow. Yarrow is a weed for some. Uh, and then nutrient rich soils, we're going to see chickweed, 
that uh, purple dead nettle, lamb's quarters, and purslanes. Then we'll look at our irrigation and drainage because uh, there are several weeds that grow in wet, poor draining soils, such as dock, chickweed, and that purple loosestrife. But then there are weeds that grow in dry soil, um, such as the mullein, the mustards, and the thistles. And then weeds that grow in hard, compact soils. Now, something I can share about weeds that grow in hard, compact soils is that their roots are typically deep divers and they're actually aerating the soil. So there could be some um, tolerance or we can welcome them for a while at least. But how we would improve all of these conditions is we're going to adjust the pH. We're going to maybe increase um, the organic matter by adding compost for the soils that are nutrient poor, the soils that are nutrient rich. Um, we're just gonna plant more plants to outcompete. But then soils that maybe have drainage issues or irrigation, we want to amend those soils to improve the water holding capacity or drainage or aerate those soils to increase compaction. Now also understand that some weeds are hitchhikers. So weed seeds can enter your garden just by chance, even though you're the you know, tidiest uh, garden keeper, but they come in on our clothes for maybe a hike. Uh, they come in on um, uh, lawn equipment from hired gardeners. This is very common. Uh, they can blow in by the wind. Uh, they can arrive in the plant material if we buy plants from the nursery or from a plant sale. Um, just by accident, they, those seeds can end up transferring and entering our garden that way. They can come in on pets fur or also from the birds. So there's a lot of ways that uh, weeds can just show up. So something to keep in mind is that we want to reduce uh, disturbing the soil. When we are doing that constant tilling or turning over the soil, it can be problematic because um, one thing that weeds have in common is that their seeds stay viable for uh, quite a long time and they will stay in that soil and they will wait till the conditions are perfect. And that's when they germinate, that's when they pop up and that's when they grow. So if we are disturbing that soil or turning it, we're sometimes bringing weed seeds to the surface. So this is something we want to avoid. We wanna outcompete weeds with desirable plants. This is the number one strategy that I like to use and it uh, works very well. We plant densely to prevent weeds from finding room to grow. Remember, weeds are opportunists. Wherever they have a chance to sprout, they will. So we want to grow healthy gardens to outcompete those weeds with desirable plants. We can also plant cover crops. This is going to be ideal for those of us that like to grow food. Uh, it's really important never to let any uh, soil lay bare. It's important to always uh, have soil covered or planted with something. And one of the main reasons uh, for the cover crops as I see is to prevent weed seeds from taking over. So we plant uh, cover crops instead of leaving that soil bare. Some of the easy faves that I love are going to be the crimson clover, the fava beans, oats, rye, and vetch. The number one most favorite of mine is going to be fava beans because not only is it an excellent cover crop, it is going to enrich in that soil. It's gonna provide nitrogen for that soil, but also this is a food uh, crop for me. I like to trim off the fava bean tips, top few inches and saute it with some sesame oil and garlic. It's delicious. And then I will always grow some fava beans off to the side, let them go fully to beans that I've got more fava beans to plant in the next season. We are going to cover that soil and protect it with a good two to three inch layers of mulch, mulch in the form of wood chips or uh, you know bark chips, anything that is a wood material. It could also be straw. Uh, when we have that two to three inch layer of mulch on top of that soil, it protects that root zone, but it also will prevent and reduce 
weed seeds from germinating and sprouting. And if they do sprout, they're a heck of a lot easier to pull from that top uh, two or three inches of mulch. As mulch breaks down, it adds nutrients to the soil, as we all know, because it's feeding that or uh, the soil organisms, which then further increases the health of our plants. Mulch is going to reduce water evaporation rate significantly, so we're losing, we're using less water. It also is going to insulate those root zones, keeping those roots warmer in the winter, cooler in the summer, reduces that soil compaction and erosion. And the big key, key takeaway is that we want to always make sure that the mulch is away from the trunk or the stems of the plant. We want to make sure that the crown of the plant is always open and free of debris and mulch. And then drip irrigation has uh, a lot to do with uh, preventing weeds. Believe it or not, when we can uh, install drip irrigation and adjust that drip irrigation to only target the root zones of our plants, making sure that we're doing nice, even watering all the way around the root zone of the plant. And then we're watering deeply to the needs of that plant. And on established plants, we're letting that soil dry out uh, two to five to 12 inches before we water again, depending on that plant material, we're actually able going to see less weeds because we are, that irrigation emitter is making direct contact with the soil. There's less water evaporation, but we're not watering areas of the garden that we don't need to water because we're focusing it just on that root zone of that plant. When we have sprinkler systems, typically that water is going in other areas beyond where we need it, and that's going to favor the weeds. So just to review the cultural controls that we just discussed, uh, we're going to adjust that pH, uh, and the fertilizing schedule is also going to help adjust um, those weeds, either re to reduce many of them that favor those soil conditions. We're going to amend that soil, uh, to increase the, um, uh, the drainage and so forth. We're going to ask our hired gardeners to use our mowing equipment so they're not bringing seeds, weed seeds in from other properties. We're going to reduce disturbing the soil. We're going to plant competitively and densely to outcompete those weeds. We're going to apply mulch uh, throughout our garden uh, we are always going to leave one section of the garden raw and plain and uncultivated for our native bees. But other than that, we're going to really apply mulch in around our garden beds to prevent those weeds. And we're only going to water the areas that are planted. And we're going to do that by favoring the drip irrigation over sprinkler systems. All right, now we're going to look at the mechanical controls or the physical controls. What's the best way to remove weeds? People ask me this all the time. They don't like the answer I have because I usually say mechanically, we're going to take advantage of the weeding tools. Now I'm going to share that hand pulling doesn't mean we're on our knees and we're pulling with our fingers, although that's kind of fun. It's very therapeutic but there's so many tools on the market and the tools are really there to make weeding much easier for us. Uh, there, yeah, so I encourage you, I invite you to go find your favorite tools out there. There are so many. Uh, they're just all shapes and sizes. There are a variety of weeding tools for different situations and different comfort levels. Um, they are either going to pull at the root, pop them out, or they're going to scrape them down or kind of rake them out. And then there's also heavy duty weed pullers that are designed to pull deeply rooted plants like scotch broom. I get really excited when I see these tools at a hardware store or landscape supply because that means there are people out there buying them and using them. They're kind of neat, a lot of fun. But there's also uh, tools on the market, such as the weed steamers and the torches. Uh, these are excellent for getting the weeds uh, it, between cracks and crevices or throughout gravel walkways or driveways. Um, they're very easy to use. Uh, they might be a little bit more expensive straight out, uh, you know, just to buy them. It's an investment, but over time, they're going to be saving you a lot of time and money.
They're very efficient and effective. Now, the weed steamers are not as available on the market. They are they are available. I know you can order them online and there are some retailers that bring them in. Uh, they are starting to get used by city workers and so forth because they can be used year round. The weed torches are only to be used during the rainy season. Once things dry out, we are not using the weed torch because we do not want to set the neighborhood on fire. Okay, I know this is a very sensitive topic for many of us. So really, we want to use those very um, strategically and very safely. But the weed torch, I use them myself. They're very effective during the rainy season to burn down those weeds uh, on my gravel driveway, but then also spot weed around my garden. We're also going to use line trimmers and mowers. So when the weeds start to get too tall and they're too big to hand pull or use one of those weeding tools, we are going to trim them or mow them. And this is a very effective way to manage the weeds. The takeaway should be that we are going to manage the weeds before they go to seed. We absolutely never want weeds to go to seed because once they do, those weed seeds are going to be in that soil for years to come. We can also use grazing animals. We see grazing animals all around, uh, the hills, public spaces, uh, you know, open spaces around the cities, even in San Francisco, we will see uh, goats managing weeds in those public areas. So it's pretty fun. I also know companies that actually rent their goats. If you have a larger property, it could be a really great solution for you. And it's kind of fun. Sheep mulching is also another amazing tool that we can use to manage weeds. You could think of this as like building lasagna. It's always going to be a, a, a couple of layers of cardboard overlapped right on top of those weeds, right on top of that lawn, if that's what we're doing. We don't even have to mow the weeds or sometimes I'll just step on them so I can flatten them out, but I'm putting that cardboard overlapped and then we're going to put no less than three inches of mulch on top, or it could be a combination of like a couple of inches of compost, a couple of inches of mulch, but no less than three inches. That is the magical number. And then over a period of time, usually about six uh, to 12 months, we're not gonna see weeds in that area. And that sheet mulch as it breaks down is does an amazing job at uh, regenerating that soil, making it ideal to grow in. Couple notes about landscape fabric. I even had some of you email me questions about landscape fabric. Landscape fabric can be a little challenging. Some things we're not aware of that it, uh, it is made from harmful chemicals. So some of us that are sensitive to that, we don't want petroleum products in our garden that just be aware. Uh, when we put landscape fabric out, it does compact the soil. So uh, if that's a concern, then you wanna avoid using it. Uh, weeding, weeds will uh, take root. They will grow through the landscape fabric. Um, as the landscape fabric ages, it starts to break down. So weeds will start to grow through it. Because remember those weeds are opportunists. Uh, and it'll make it very difficult to pull those weeds because those roots are going to be underneath that fabric. And weed fabrics can get expensive. Typically we will we see how expensive they are. We'll kind of go for one that's a little bit more economical, but what we learned or what we know is that um, the weed fabrics, these landscape fabrics have a lifespan. The ones that are rated for 10 years are going to be the most expensive, but the ones that are rated for three years will be the least expensive. So that kind of plays into you know the story. Um, any of the existing plants that we have in our garden that we're placing the weed cloth around will suffer. They're not going to get that. Um, the microbiology around the soil will not be able to get the nutrients or the um, hydration that they would prefer if there was no weed uh, fabric. Yes, uh, water will move through the weed fabric, but it is um, a slight barrier. And if we do have irrigation underneath the weed barrier, it's going to be really difficult to identify if there is a break or if it needs to be repaired. And as I mentioned that the weed barrier will break down over time, which can be really problematic to deal with. So just give it some second thoughts. 
um, before you sheet mulching might be a better option. Solarization is something that I've been hearing folks using. Um, this is kind of cool. It can be very effective. Uh, solarization is a non-chemical method for controlling soil-borne pests using that high, the high temperatures produced by capturing the radiant energy from the sun. Super cool. This method involves heating the soil by covering it with uh, clear plastic for uh, about four to six weeks during the hot period of um, yeah, that hot season or a, a hot period of time. The plastic tarps will allow the sun's radiant energy to be trapped in the soil heating the top 12 to 18 inches to temperatures lethal to a wide range of soil-borne pests, including weeds, but also plant pathogens, nematodes, and other insects. So when properly done, the top layer of soil will heat up to as high as 140 degrees Fahrenheit, which is really amazing. This also depends on geographic locations, but you know it's just pretty cool. So, uh, but something else to keep in mind that soil moisture is important to this process because wet soil conditions heat better than dry. And that moisture is also going to make the soil pests weakened by the heat uh, and more vulnerable to be attacked by beneficial soil microorganisms during and after the treatment. So uh, this is a little bit more technical. I'd invite you to look up, get more information by visiting the UC IPM website. And there is a nice article about how to take advantage of solarization. And then when we're dealing with specific weeds, specifically annual and biannual weeds, they're very easy to hand pull when they've just emerged, or we're going to hoe them or uh, manage them with some type of a weeding tool at first sight, but when the soil has dried out. So we have been getting a lot of rains, uh, it's not a good idea. It's not advised to ever walk on the soil or work soil when it's wet. And I mean like wet from after rain, but after things have drained some, it could still be moist, but boy, those weeds are so easy to hand pull out. We can also use the weed torch or the steamer. Weed torch is only going to be done during the rainy season. And, but by all means, we avoid letting those seeds, those weeds go to seed, as I mentioned. Perennial weeds will be a little more challenging. We want to dig them out or pull them out. We're going to cut them down or mow them down. Uh, it is always ideal to dig them out because we're taking out the roots when we're mowing them, the root or cutting them down, the roots are staying. So it's going to just grow a bigger plant next time. So that's why it's always nice. Although every time we cut or mow, we're actually weakening that plant because it's not able to photosynthesize. So over time, that plant might actually disappear. We can absolutely use the weed torch or the steamer. Uh, sheet mulching is excellent, but again, we want to avoid letting that plant go to seed. Uh, tips for weeding, because uh, it can get really overwhelming, we're going to prioritize the weeds. So people that have larger uh, properties or larger areas that are uh, saturated with weeds, let's start by uh, only picking one so it might just be the thistles. So we'll go through and we'll only remove the thistles. Phew. Okay, that's done. All right, okay, what's the next one? Okay, let's focus on the blackberry. When blackberry and poison oak is young, it is really easy to hand pull. But yes, poison oak, uh, many of us get dermal reactions. So we're going to put those uh, disposable gloves on. We're going to wear our long sleeves fully clothed. We're going to pull the weeds, put a, the poison oak, put it in a paper bag. We're going to close up that paper bag and we're going to put it in the garbage. We do not put it in the green waste bin because we don't want other people down the line getting coming in contact with that poison oak and possibly getting irritation from it. We never put weeds into the compost, our home compost systems, unless we are 100% sure it's not going to spread, that it's 100% sure not carrying any seeds. Okay, if we are 100% sure that it's not going to spread, grow, or uh, contain seeds, then yes, we could put it in our home compost. And we want to avoid planting a pest, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a moment. Weeds in turf areas, this can be really challenging. Yes, this is my quote unquote front lawn. If you see, it's this was last year, it's pretty weedy. But uh, 
how do we manage it? We increase the health of the lawn. When we can increase the health of the lawn, that turf can get thicker and outcompete those weeds. We are going to water uh, deeper to reduce weeds. Oftentimes we're taught to water lawns and turf areas shallowly. Well, what we're really doing is weedy, we're watering the weeds because weeds, many weeds are shallowly rooted. Uh, turf lawn roots can dive very deep, uh, in some cases six feet, yes, six feet. So what we wanna do is we just wanna water a little deeper. We wanna drive that water down and try to grow lawn roots that can be about 12 inches deep. And then we're letting that soil dry out several inches before we water again. This is now favoring the lawn and not favoring the weeds. So we're not going to see the weeds. We are going to adjust the mow height for the season. So I like to say we water uh, shorter when we, sorry, we mow shorter, the lawn shorter when we have shorter daylight hours. And then we will mow the lawn taller when we have longer daylight hours. Uh, when we have taller blades of grass during the summer, it's, it's going to provide shade for the roots, reducing water evaporation rate. When we're watering uh, or we're mowing shorter during the winter months, the rainy season, that allows those root zones to dry, the blades of grass to dry, and we're gonna reduce uh, fungal issues. We want to aerate that lawn one to two times a year, ideally in the spring and then on the fall, we're gonna rake out the thinnest layer of compost ever. It's just gonna be an eighth of an inch to get that compost, that microbiology down into those holes where we've just aerated. We are going to oversee to thicken the lawn and this can be every week if we want it to be. We just really want to have a very thick lawn. We're gonna feed organically because remember organic fertilizers feed the microbiology and those root zones. So then we'll have a thicker, healthier lawn. We wanna keep those weeds in check by addressing them, hand pulling them at first sight. And we wanna leave the clippings. When we mow the lawn, we want to leave those clippings because it's actually free nitrogen that we're able to feed our soil. Impossible. Some of these weeds feel like they're impossible. So oxalis is a big one that pops up this time of the year, but once the temperatures warm up, it just disappears. However, vinca major and English ivy, boy, they can be beets. The English ivy can actually grow up trees and choke out trees. Uh, vinca major uh, can really take over areas. Uh, when it comes to these weeds, we just want to um, pull them at first sight, okay? Vinca major is really easy to pull, but it, the ha it grows on runners. So if we can get a whole section, it's very satisfying. English ivy, we're removing immediately. I have English ivy coming over from the neighbors. The birds bring it in. I can recognize it. I will remove those seedlings. Um, and oxalis, it's, a, it's an ongoing battle, right? But when we can uh, pull them and be very persistent about hand pulling, um, then over time, we're going to reduce that plant's population because we're weakening that plant, that plant's not able to photosynthesize. Crabgrass, again, something that might seem impossible, but it's very easy to manage using a variety of those cultural controls that we talked about. So uh, in the landscape and flower beds, we're gonna hand pull at first sight. We wanna protect that soil with mulch to prevent seeds from germinating, okay? We're gonna control that crabgrass before it sets seed. This is really important because those seeds can remain in the soil uh, viable, be really active, ready for their chance to germinate for three years, okay? Uh, we, any of the crabgrass that we're managing now is most likely from seeds from years past. So it's just very important. We're going crabgrass that's in turf areas. We just want to increase the health of that turf, as I just shared, and that's going to reduce that crabgrass. If we have crabgrass growing into a ground cover, most likely we're going to have to, and hand pulling isn't working. We're just going to have to dig up that ground cover, physically remove the crabgrass, replant that ground cover. So it can be kind of labor intensive. And then don't plant a pest. So um, there are many plants in the garden center world at nurseries that we can purchase. And uh, someone that's worked in the garden industry since the 90s, so quite a while, uh, heliochrysum was very popular in the 90s. Um, many of the clients I worked for wanted these glorious 
containers on their patios or their window boxes. They just, and Heliochrysum just has this really nice color. There's a limelight green one that's kind of chartreuse or this kind of like uh, soft minty bluish colored one. Um, very nice color accent. But then what we learned was it would reseed easily and um, it would interfere with a lot of the native wildlife habitat and uh, kind of grow where it shouldn't. This plant is still available in retail nurseries, which I'm really surprised about um, several years, decades after we learned it was a pest. So um, there are some campaigns right now through the California Invasive Plant Council, Cal Ipsy, as well as they started a campaign that's partnered with retailers called Plant Right. I encourage you to check these websites out just to know what plants are out there that are available for us to purchase and plant in our gardens, but we shouldn't because they are, um, they are problematic and they are displacing um, important plants that we really want to keep around our, um, around our natural areas. All right. Now we're going to talk about the chemical controls. These are the pesticides. Uh, the herbicides specifically is what we call uh, pesticides that kill weeds. So what about using them? There are so many eco-friendlies on the market. Why aren't we just using them? How come I'm not talking about them so much? Well, whenever it comes to pest management, remember we're going to go for the pesticides as the last resort when we've exercised all the other means. And yes, pesticides, there is a, a place for them in pest management, but they shouldn't be our go-to answer. They shouldn't be our go-to solution unless it's absolutely the only thing we can do. And I will share, it's a very rare occasion that I need to go for a pesticide as a professional gardener, a professional garden educator. Um, yeah, very rare occasion. So first, straight off the bat, we wanna learn how to read that label and get really comfortable reading the label. So I'm at a garden center, I see this product. I look at this label, ooh, fast acting weed and grass killer. Okay, kills all types of weeds and grasses, nice. Oh, it's registered for organic gardening. This is the international uh, symbol for uh, organic gardening. Okay, great, that means it's gonna be less toxic. Ooh, now what's the active ingredient? All right, I'm gonna look these active ingredients up because I have no idea what they are. And I learned that these are going to be very effective. The caprylic acid, capric acid, these are very effective uh, herbicide combo that is not going to be toxic to the waterways. It's not gonna to be toxic to use around my pets or children once it's dry. So, okay, this might be the perfect thing. So let's further read this label. Okay, so there's some directions for use. This product is a contact, non-select, broad spectrum, foliar applied grass and weed killer. What the heck does that mean? Contact means it has to make contact with the leaf tissue or plant tissue. Non-select meaning that it kills indiscriminately. Broad spectrum means there's a very long list of pests. In this case, it's plants pest that it kills. It is to be sprayed uh, to the foliar, to the leaf, to the foliage uh, to kill it. And it only controls actively growing emerged green vegetation. So this is not to be used as a preventative. It has to be sprayed onto the plant parts. It is effective on annual, perennial, and, grassy, and grassy weeds. This product does not translocate. It means it's not moving through the vascular system of that plant. Kills many types of weeds and grasses. It's an alternative. It's um, an alternate solution to systemic. Sin, sorry, sy synthetic grass and weed killers. It does not translocate. Doesn't move through the vascular system. It is rainproof once dry and is people and pet safe when used as directed. And it kills a very long list of plants. So here it says typical vegetation controlled, but not limited to means that this is just an assortment of plants we can use it on, but it, it is not limited to that. It is really going to kill anything it comes in contact with. 
And then there's always going to be a precautionary statement because this is registered as a pesticide. So it already says caution, we, it can cause eye irritation. We want to always wear a PPE when using pesticides, even um, insecticidal soap, which is the mildest of all. We want to make sure we are protecting our eyes, we're not breathing it in, and we are covering our skin so that we don't have a dermal reaction. And then um, we are not going to uh, spray this directly into the waterways. And once it is dry on the plant or in the area, it will be safe for pets and children to enter without being um, contaminated. Understand how pesticides work. So that was just an introduction to the label. That was an example. But what words you're going to see, the types of words you're going to see on the label are going to be narrow spectrum or select. That means it only kills a very few closely related organisms, a very short list of plants, for, for instance. Broad spectrum or non-select is going to be the example of the label I just read. Kills a range of pests and non-targeted organisms. Contact means it kills when it touches the external surface of the targeted organism, the plant tissue. Systemic or translocated, absorbs and circulates throughout that plant's vascular system. Pre-emergent, inhibits weed seeds from sprouting or emerging from the soil. Post-emergent, is used after weeds have emerged from the soil. Timing is important. Some herbicides kill weeds quickly. That means their top kills, it burns them down, um, which is great. That's what we wanna see. And that's why it's so important to hit those weeds when they're little, when they're young, when the root systems haven't um, fully established, those root systems are still weak. We can, top kills are very effective, very efficient. But others can take up to a week or more because they're translocating, they're moving through that plant. So it could take a while before we actually see that plant die. Some can persist in the plants and the soil for long periods of time. So this is problematic if we want to kill the weeds, but then plant desirable plants, those desirable plants will also be impacted by, this, uh, by that product. Some have active ingredients that are more likely to move through the soil and into the groundwater. So yet another reason to look for our little blue tags that will identify which products are going to be safe and effective that will not be a groundwater contaminant or water quality issue. No pesticide is risk-free. So unintended consequences of herbicide use, regardless if it's a synthetic or an eco-friendly, and especially if it's a do-it-yourself uh, pesticide, we really want to be careful and understand what are the consequences of our actions. Drift, uh, that means when there's a breeze of five miles an hour or more, can actually blow that pesticide to non-targeted plants. See this a lot. This photo is actually a rose emerging and it has been damaged by glyphosate. So this might look like there's a disease or some problem and we'll go to the garden center. We're like, oh my gosh, I've got a disease on my rose. It was actually because during its dormant phase, the winter, someone sprayed glyphosate in the area and it drifted. Pesticides can also um, cause contamination of the soil or groundwater when improperly applied or overused. More is not better. Uh, we can also damage the soil microbiology. Again, more is not better. We always wanna follow those directions and apply in accordance to the labels instructions. And then what about the DIY weed killers? So oftentimes we see these recipes on the interwebs. Uh, dish soap, common dish soap that we might use is actually detergent and not true soap. Castile soap by Dr. Bronner's is the only true soap on the market. Anything else that we might be using to kill weeds or to kill aphids is actually a detergent, regardless if it's eco-friendly or not, or more natural or holistic or not. It has degreasers in it that actually can be really problematic to that plant, maybe beneficial for a weed, but some things, some products that detergents that are not eco-friendly or more natural will have ingredients that are actually going to be toxic to um, uh, the waterways, which is ironic and also can be uh, 
problematic or a health hazard. So if you have a product at home, get curious, read the active ingredients and um, see what you're using and if you still wanna use that product or not. Salt, salt is detrimental to the soil, to worms and other soil organisms. So if we're adding that to the soil, we will not be able to grow plants in that area for a very long time. And vinegar, vinegar needs to be used with extreme caution. Yes, there are horticultural vinegars on the market right now for managing weeds. I would just purchase that if that's what you'd like to do and omit the dish soap, omit the salt, okay? Because the vinegar is gonna do a great job. However, we wanna use this with caution, okay? Because remember household vinegar, what we are uh, flavoring our food with is just 5% acidic acid. 11% uh, acidic acid is going to be strong enough to burn the skin and cause eye damage. But horticultural vinegar, what we can buy which is 20 to 30% acetic acid is strong enough to cause blindness and is corrosive to metals. So we wanna just be careful just because it's organic, it's registered for organic use. It is still, we need to use a lot of caution and use these with, you know, and if we're looking for something that's, you know, a DIY, just use boiling water, okay? It kills weeds, but we really wanna use caution not to burn ourselves. So it's always best to buy products that have a label on it so you can read the label and understand how to use that product. And you can learn more about pesticides by visiting OMRI. This is the Organic Materials Review Institute and the National Pesticide Information Center. These are both great resources to understand how the active ingredients of our products work. Our Water Our World has a fact sheets on weeds. Uh, this is going to be really helpful for identifying weeds and uh, how to manage weeds. Uh, please have a look at our website, ourwaterourworld.org. There's also one on lawns that can also go into some of those uh, details I talked about. And then uh, back to University of California, their weed gallery. This is going to be really helpful now that we've learned so much about identifying weeds and how they grow. So this is going to take it to the next level. And then for all of our past educational programs that we have provided uh, in partnership with um, the Fairfield Sassoon Sewer District, the um, Vallejo flood, Waste and Floodwater, and the um, Solano Stormwater Alliance, to make sure I had all those straight, we can visit the Fairfield Sassoon Sewer District's website under public outreach to view the, our past recorded educational webinars. That's where they land. And for all of you that are joining us today, um, I'd just like to finish by saying um, weeds are flowers too once we get to know them. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll finish with your questions. If questions come up later, please, I'm always available. Please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm Suzanne at plantharmony.org.